Ah, we're there we live. Go. Guru Nation, live. Fraud Pod Nation. Welcome to another episode of Fraud Pod. Back by popular demand with the one and only. You know, we have this contract that we go through. Um, but we have so much to get into, right? We've been dissecting like section by section of this contract from a sponsor. But last time we did that, we couldn't get into like the things we wanted because they're trying yeah. to spend an hour on a paragraph. So <laughs> By the way, he charges by the hour. So, <laughs> you know, those two things go hand in hand. But it's all free for you so far, isn't it? Jeez, well, this yes. This is all free advice free. for everyone who's listening for educational reasons. Not legal or medical exactly. advice, but um, educational and to do your own homework. Uh, just to, like, pique your interests. Yeah, kind of a wild day today. Well, yesterday, you know, this guidance came out. Actually, um, here's the funny part. Two guidances came out. Everyone's missed the second guidance, which I quite honestly haven't even read yet. But I think it's super important. By We're get into a little bit of that. Yeah, I know you read. The only thing I read about it was Brad Hightower's post about. I guess we can go to patients' homes, and I was like, well, maybe sites have already been doing that, you know, here and there. Just yeah, they should call this, this DCT guidance should just be called "In Love of Telehealth," or stuff you may, you probably don't know, and quite bluntly, the FDA either doesn't want to tell you about so i'm wondering how many new startups you know just get funding based off of this <sighs> guidance and at the end of the day nothing really will change i mean like sites have been calling patients and doing remote visits sites have been even before telehealth was a thing sites have been going to patients homes Dashaun, I remember one of my first studies I ever worked on. It got me introduced to research. It was 2003. I was a summer intern for the clinic um, psychiatric study, observational study, where my dad and a few other doctors, you know, were running. I mean, they just had a busy private practice, mm -hmm. and they... They were like, here's a research study. Um, have fun this summer. And <laughs> it was essentially just like a diary study. Yeah. And I would go to these patients lived in assisted living facilities. Like, there's no way they were coming to me. Yeah. So I would go to them. Was I doing DCT in 2003? You were. You absolutely okay, were. So what's, what's like groundbreaking about this? So like I said, I think the key here is uh, two things. Number one, legitimizing um, pharmacies because people are wondering whether that's going to happen. Pharmacy? And How do you get – only a pharmacist can get pharmacy out of this. Well, oh. first of all, they actually specifically call it pharmacies in the guidance. Ah, okay, okay. Um, and so as part of the DCT thing, they say local healthcare practitioner, practitioners, including pharmacies. So, man, your phone's gonna be blowing up after this. <laughs> We're gonna keep talking. My phone's gonna blow up for this other reason, which the FDA calls out. But I can tell you right now, the vast majority of small clinical trial sites do not know how to comply. We're gonna get because, into this, but yeah, just answer me this, please. Yeah, because this yeah. seems to happen a lot in our industry. Yeah, and this makes news events, yeah, not newsworthy for me and a bunch of other site owners that. You know, we're sitting around like, okay, that's guidance. Wow. Like, I've been doing this since 02. Yeah. What is, yeah. like, so special about this? Well, I think a couple of different things uh, that are that's really special. Uh, some of it makes things a little bit easier for smaller sites, um, which is, for example, I think the delegation of authority logs just became a lot easier because of this guidance. Um, because so? they're saying, well, they specifically come out and say, here are the people we want on your 1572. Here's what actually qualifies as a, as a sub-investigator. And here are the types of people who need to be on the 1572 or the delegation of authority logs, which I think is important because mm. do, you, do you train every single person or do you not? What is, who, who needs to be on there? I think that's really important because you see a lot of findings based on delegation of authority and yes. not okay. being on the 1572. Fair enough, fair enough. So what, what did they say? Well, they basically said that if the trial is involved, and you need to be like there's special special training involved. It's not just part of your regular clinical course of practice. Uh, you you need to be on the 1572 and or the delegation of authority. But if it's just, um, for example, a nurse drawing blood, well, she does that every single day in her clinical practice, anyways. She may not need to be part of it. Right. So that I think changes a lot of um, 
sort of what goes on there and what doesn't and mm-hmm. should hopefully help sites limit. Now it's going to cause some some complexity. So it draws a line if, in the sand because we already do this. We don't put you, our phlebotomist on the... Feeling. You may not, but now you know that you can get away with it. I see. So if the FDA calls you out, you can go, this was a determination we made and we actually have it in our policies. I see. So let, let's be honest, Dan. A lot of things you do are sort of my your best judgment on what to, how to handle it. Of and course. then the law catches up with you in like five years. So Yeah, that's how yeah. these things work. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so what we're getting is a law saying, yeah, Dan, you were right. But you didn't have the law backing you that second when you, when you were doing it. Because, right. And I think that's, that's part of the advantage, right? I think what you're also seeing is um, what, what most people don't realize. This is, this, we're now going to tie this uh, talk into the Janet Jackson nipple case. You remember that Janet from soup from the Super Bowl? Of course. Yeah, this all this went all the way to the uh, went to the Supreme Court. It was Fox v. FCC, uh-huh. Supreme Court case, and in it, the court basically was uh, charged with trying to understand. Well, can we? Can was it a problem that Janet, Janet Jackson's nipple showed up during the Super Bowl? And the court said, was it not allowed? Was, did you have a rule saying that you can't do that? No, we didn't have that explicit rule, but, but they should have known or they, sh- they should have known better. And the court said, if you don't explicitly say no, it's a yes. In the same specific way, if you, they don't explicitly say no, it's a yes. You didn't say that you can't have people go out and um, take care of patients. Well, then it's a yes. Now, should these people have been on the 1572 or in the, de- or in the delegation of authority? Well, they te- technically had anyone who was involved in the clinical research needs to be on the delegation of authority log or in the 1572, depending on what it is. But they didn't really mean it. And that's the problem. We now have explicit direction about what they actually meant. Okay, fair enough. That, I mean, I guess having the guidance on paper, because this is still a guidance at the end of the day, right? It is. Dropped? Correct. Okay. And you were saying something else. Now you were saying something interesting about... So, first of all, I thought guidance already dropped about being able to do home visits. They did. There were, there, there, there are multiple guidances, and they usually build on each other. Um, oh, okay, so they repeat. They can repeat themselves all the time. Previous. Okay. All right. So even less noteworthy. But um, <laughs> what about... Uh, you were saying doctors are going to love this. So two different parts. So before we get to the doctor's part, the other thing, oh, actually, let, let's, let's address the doctor's part first. Doctors are going to love this because this is now, the FDA basically, without using these words, went, you know what? You guys need to pay other doctors, not even involved in clinical research, a bunch of money. And, and you'd go, how the hell did they say that? Ah. Because they said that you can have people who are not directly involved in your clinical research who are doing these other things, for example, in the clinical practice. And it's not just the doctors, it's anyone else, right? They're doing all this adjacent stuff. You, you can have them involved. Well, if you're going to have them involved, do you think they're just not going to want to get paid? Wait, what do you mean they can get involved? So like so, do a physical or... So uh, if, if the physical is part of their normal practice, for example, right? Uh, right. Not the PI. Say, we're not talking about the we're PI. We're not talking about the PI. Okay. It, um, if it's part of the diagnosis or part of the actual study protocol, you, that was already like you need to pay them. Uh, now we're saying there's some people who don't have to be on that 1572, don't have to be on the delegation of authority log, right? We just said that. If that's true, there are people who are doing work who are not on that 1572 or in that delegation of authority log, which don't need to be specifically trained, right? If that's true, they right. still need to be get paid. They aren't going to just do stuff for you for free. They don't. <laughs> I mean, you can try to pull that off, but you're a businessman. You're not doing anything for free, are you? I'm not. No. Exactly right. But you're oh. expecting the doctors to? Um, I don't think I've ever had a doctor do something for free, other than refer a patient for a study. Yeah, but not. But now Does that change that. Does this that, change that? That they make referrals? Well, there's another like a thing. Like pre-screening, this where it gets crazy. Well, so it's, it doesn't explicitly say you have to pay the doctor. So it doesn't come out and say you need to pay the doctor. Right. My thought process is very clearly, you're saying that the doctor can do X, Y, Z, even if they're not part of the study. In that case, why should the doctor do ABC while they're not part of the study? The only reason is because they're going to get paid. So like, in, uh, so a practical example would be, hey, doc, 
you know, my PI and I are running this study for, let's say, psoriasis. Yeah. We know you have a lot of patients here in your yep. practice. Yeah. Here's a pre-screening checklist. We will pay you for every one you submit. Well, what we, we'd have to explore whether that's allowed or is that considered to be part of the trial? You, the, you may be 100% correct. I don't know explicitly what that, that might be. That would and would not be part of the trial because not maybe, everyone, like, maybe not everyone gets someone that it. doesn't, yeah, doesn't qualify. Yeah, and and we'd have to explore that individually, and that's when you come find me again. One eight hundred call Darshan. <laughs> that is not the number, but <laughs> I can because you put that I on like who, LinkedIn. I wonder who that are, like, goes One eight hundred Darshan. Like, no, that's not my number. <laughs> yeah, that's not Darshan's number. Just message him on LinkedIn. That's a lot easier. Yeah, or just call me at three zero two two five two six nine five nine. But okay, there you go. Uh, but I think that it legitimizes a lot of efforts that, for example, you might now have CRAs who are not trained in the study, but our medical assistants who are not trained in the study, who can now do other study-related, but not study-specific things. We had, a patient, still get paid. we had a patient recently who um, had an AE. They weren't feeling well. Yeah. We don't know if it was related to the study yeah. drug or not. It does. It's irrelevant. Yeah. In the clinic, the PI said, hey, um, he called one of his MAs, Yeah, give her an IV. You yeah. know, she needs IV fluid. It's hot here in Arizona, so she was dehydrated. Yeah. And none of our research staff have done IVs. You know, we're all yeah. coordinators. So yeah. their MA did it. And the MA, right. you know, basically did it as a favor for her boss. And um, yeah, so this would be a perfect example. Then. Yeah, this would this could potentially be exactly the type of thing the FDA is talking about. Now, should the MA get paid for that? Should the sponsor pay the MA for going and taking care of this adverse event? And I've Probably. asked their PI that when their MAs do favors, I said, hey, you want me to pay them? And he said, no, they're on the clock for me already. That's nice of him, but now he can explicitly say that we're going to start, we're going to build a sponsor, the CRO for this. Hmm, okay. And so he has the, the guidance to back him up. Exactly right. Exactly okay. right. So I if the see FDA how doctors to... are like happy about this, this has been going on for decades. It, it has been going on, but it, now you explicitly have allowance for it, which we did not have before. Sure, sure. But it, to me, I'm a big research... fan of every every sponsor goes, and I, I do this because I also negotiate for sponsors. But sponsors generally go, look, this is part of the pr uh, practice of doing medicine, or this is part of the clinical research process. We're not paying you extra for that. Well. The FDA is explicitly saying it is outside the clinical research ah, process. Chris Sub, are you listening? You can get more money now. <laughs> I think Chris is listening. By the way, Chris has a new newsletter. That's right. I signed up for that thing. I think I was subscriber number 45 because yeah, I was like three minutes late. It's riveting stuff. Um, Chris and the voice of random characters from famous <laughs> movies. So last week was Forrest Gump. We'll see who we get next week. I didn't week. see that. Yeah. That's actually a really good hook, though, isn't it? You think it's good? I, I, you know, he kind of joked around with me about that, and I told him he should just do it. Oh, I signed up as soon as I heard. Yeah, I, if you don't have a brand, like, you have a lot of, if you don't have an established brand, you have a lot of creativity at your disposal right. that, right. you know, incumbents are not afforded generally. Although I don't care. But I, I don't need another newsletter. I don't need another newsletter. <laughs> uh, okay, so back to the doctor's. So there was another thing you said. Yeah, that. there are a couple other things. So there are two okay. big things. Yeah, I let's go through all of them. Yeah, uh, we can share the guidance and I can like go through some of the thoughts there. But yeah, do you still uh, want to get into med spas at the end of this one? We absolutely can if, if okay. we get yeah. to it. Yeah, you yeah. know how we start with like good intentions and then we get pulled into like other directions? Oh, these are the good intentions? Okay, gotcha. This <laughs> can be a rough one. We'll find out. Um, By the way, congrats on the art piece. Thank you. You're going to do a live stream unboxing? We, you keep saying that I should do a live stream, so we may, we may land up doing it because, you know but what? your background, it's not going to fit where you're sitting. No, no, it's not going to sit here. It's not going to fit here. So um, how are you going to put it? piece from recently. Are you going to feature it on videos? Like, people want to know now. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it up. Only because when Dan Safar tells you to do it, you do these things. If I you're had it, I mean... I feel like, by the way, that's another attorney issue. Like, it's a tax write-off, maybe, if you use it as your video props. The, so you really need to fa follow this woman, Jasmine DeLucci, who's like a tax lawyer. I'm, I don't know her or anything, but I love her, like, the stuff she puts out. 
So yeah. just putting something behind you doesn't make it a tax write-off. Um, but yeah, we can talk about that as well. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I love. Tax I have stuff. nothing. For the record, I have nothing behind me. If any regulators listening, I have a virtual um, background. So let's start with just like I said. I think that this guidance should really be titled "Love Letter to Telehealth," because. Everything in here is all about telehealth. Telehealth sounds so like 1980s, like sponsored Why? by AT and T, sponsored by Ma Bell. <laughs> Probably right. So, what is telehealth? You call a patient on the phone, or you text so them? telehealth is? And I, they actually define telehealth according to the FDA. So let's go to the right. definitions. Yeah, let's go to that because is telehealth it Zoom? use is of it a electronic phone? medium information and telecommunication technologies to support remote interactions between uh, clinical trial personnel and uh, trial participants. Okay, I, so texting is telehealth. Absolutely. Phone is telehealth. Going to the pharmacy is not telehealth. However, it is decentralized clinical trials. Going to the pharmacy is not telehealth, but if the pharmacy texts the patient reminders, yes. that becomes Absolutely. telehealth. What you also have to remember is in those scenarios, because uh, I'm, I'm working on a couple of telehealth projects right now, um, and it's fascinating because what most people think is that, oh, FDA said telehealth, we're now good to go telehealth. There are a bunch of state rules that kick in. For example, you put on, and, and you're seeing a lot of uh, sites do this because sponsor protocols include this, walking around with like an, uh, an, an eye watch, for example. And people are like, oh, you know what? It's part of the study, good to go. State mm -hmm. laws decide whether you can use that or not. There are privacy rules that kick in. There are uh, uh, informed consents specific to telehealth that have to be signed. You can just go, FDA said, okay. That's just one of the organizations you have to worry about. Right. And right. That, but most people don't realize that. Most sites have not done what is required. Like you and I have talked about the corporate practice of medicine. And, and the FDA is not you, even the one that has actual teeth, if you ask someone like Patrick Stone. I mean... The FDA is not even the enforcer necessarily. DOJ. There you go. Yeah. DOJ, OIG, uh, U.S. State Attorney, U.S. Attorney's Office. Right. They're all going to come after you. When you're they doing uh, studies with controlled substances, as DEA. Yep. yep you DEA. know, if you mix if you mix telehealth with DEA type stuff, I mean, they could look at that stuff too. Oh, there's tons of it. Do you want me to show you guys? The, uh, here, telehealth prosecution. I mean, anything uh, is like evidence. Anything's Here. documentation and in, in research and law. Because you asked for hundred million dollar Adderall distribution healthcare fraud scheme. What a uh, time to be alive! And that's li Los Angeles in your neighborhood. Yeah, telemedicine. Not surprising. Not surprising. That's also yeah. where they used to do the patient dumping for hospitals. Yeah, remember that? I do remember that. I do remember that. But this is just one of the examples. So let's let's start from the beginning. Go through some of the topics that you should be thinking about as part of the guidance. And, and this is why you come on to the podcast, because this guidance dropped yesterday and we're already talking about it. It's dropped. It's hot. You know, it's not and as I'm hot like, as Craig getting escor escorted out of D farm with police, but it's 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 close. I am not touching that. I know you're very um, safe. You know, have you ever been in D farm? I don't care. No. I've never been. I'm not rich enough for that kind of stuff. Ah, Unless the one's go. paying for me to go there, I can't afford to. Me too. But that was in your neck of the woods. You should have gone. It's was it? Philly. Was it in Philly? Oh, I didn't know it was in Philly. I have no idea. If no one invites me, I don't go. Well, I didn't uh, know until Craig told me about his. Uh, Craig's actually nearby, around. though. So it's it's yeah. not. Uh, yeah, I've, yeah. So anyway, so let's start with telehealth. Number one, it goes to state laws. You actually need to know that. Uh, and, and state laws goes into things like who can prescribe. So it's not just anyone. Um right. There are specific laws dispensing what if you start dispensing from your uh office does that render you into a pharmacy at that point in which case do you need a pharmacist and what rules kick in um mm -hmm. requesting records there are states for example new jersey that says that before you do anything via telehealth you first need to have all the records to look at that what well, are you doing that do you have what do you mean all the get that? oh new jersey is crazy okay new jersey has, wow. re has requirements around that um then uh, out-of-state practitioner. So one of the big things of this is, oh, you know what? We're going to have a centralized PI and we're going to have a bunch of different sites all over. Well, if you're going to do that, does that meet, meet that state's telehealth requirements? 
the oversight requirements because otherwise you're practicing in a state that you are not qualified to practice in. So that becomes another issue. Uh, professional liability insurance, you need, you may need to get specific telehealth liability insurance and maybe, maybe not, depending on how it plans out. And we actually, I actually did an interview yesterday with an insurance broker specifically for clinical trial sites around what kind of insurance you need. I did not get into the telehealth question because I did not realize it was so big right now. But wow. stay tuned. I'll bring you back on for that. But you can check out my podcast for that. But going back, um, the professional liability insurance, obviously, you need, to, um, you need to look at what specific liability insurance you need. Informed consent. Telehealth actually requires its own informed consent in most states. So um, you, you then need to get your HIPAA waiver. You need to get your telehealth uh, insurance. Uh, and then depending on what kind of study you're doing, for example, if you're doing weight loss stuff, you may need to look at whether you need to get, like Florida has specific rules around weight loss studies. Uh, well, not weight loss studies, around weight loss programs. Question is, does your study qualify as a program? And I don't know. I haven't looked into that question for anyone yet. Well, but, I would guess as a non-attorney, the answer is your research does not qualify as any type of program except research. Ooh, except what are you advertising it for? Would you would you like to lose a bunch of weight? No, we're doing a study on that. Oh, I've seen those. I've seen those ads. We don't advertise. Or you what if the what if that? Well, we do. Shout out to <laughs> patient Ace. What if the ad says weight loss study in Yuma? Click here. So so let's say it says weight loss study in Yuma. Would people reasonably interpret that to be a program? And well, we have to look at what the definition of program is. Sure, of course they would. Yeah, they don't know. Most people don't know what research is. Correct. So if that's true, there's, for example, I think Florida has a requirement that you have to give them a certain bill of rights. They have to know how long the program is, for example, how long the study is. They have to sign ah, off on that. Really? There are all these requirements that kick in. In um, Florida, of all places, wow. <laughs> marketing, for example, are your claims completely unreasonable? The Senate is going after companies around uh, telecommunications and the types of claims being made, um, especially in the context of telehealth. So be careful of that. So this is not you, just the IRBs policing. Correct. This. Correct. So and this is just some of the now rules. How do, the, how do these some of these regulators work? Like the actual enforcers. You were saying on the state level or whatever. Do they hire people to just scour social media looking for these ads? Or It can be a variety of things. For example, it's often the FTC that starts this process. And the okay. FTC is looking. Um, the F, uh, you'll have DOJ, OIG, you'll have, uh, you'll have whistleblowers, you'll have, uh, privacy violations. Uh, you, we might discover in the process of investigating, investigating a privacy violation that you weren't qualified to do all this other stuff as well. So the moment you open Pandora's box, all kinds of stuff starts spilling out. So I see. be careful. And, ju and just to be clear, this is why we do the podcast because we start. We are literally at paragraph one. We only did one word so far, uh, and you tell me that I take very long with a paragraph. You're just defining it, by the way. Exactly. Uh, let's keep going. Bottom line of all these fraud pods is no one is compliant ever <laughs> with anything. Bottom line of all these fraud pods, you can always become compliant, and it's part of a quality assur assurance process. You should be thinking about more. Right. You can, uh, compliance is like yoga. You can never reach like full potential. You just need to keep stretching. And like quality. You should always be improving with quality as well. Sure. Uh, okay. This one everyone knows, but I'm going to remind everyone. FDA's guidance documents do not establish legally enforceable responsibilities. It is only the agency's current thinking on a topic. Far too many people are like citing the FDA. Like the FDA... In most lawsuits, the FDA is, in the end, simply a party. If you follow them, you're less likely to get dinged. But in the end, can you challenge them? Yeah. Do you want to? Most people don't. Uh, appropriately so. It doesn't make sense to do that. Um, but if you have a really good reason why you don't want to follow them, theoretically, you could. <laughs> Victoria seems to agree with you. Victoria, welcome to the fraud pod. It's like yoga. <laughs> but Alicia seems to think we're doing well. Uh, shout out to Alicia. She was just on the radio station out there in Missouri. Really? Being an ambassador for clinical research, yeah. Look at that. She's an SOS attendee. But see, We that's... know our SOS fam, man. You're not SOS fam yet. And when I you know. Come, I'm trying to do that right now. That, that's my fam. next sign up. 
I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go anywhere, but I know I'm coming for SOS. Okay. I'm going to make a meme about this. Come to SOS and you won't be escorted out by police. I'm going to run <laughs> with you that. Just right now. I won't even do... Yeah, why would we... You won't cause the police to escort you out. But other might, others might. What do you mean? The police are going to escort people out at well, a conference? Someone starts making a ruckus. You may not cause... That's people different. To you know, just like the FDA. We have guidances. <laughs> and if you start making a guidance, local officials will get involved. <laughs> Ashley's already a fan. Ashley, I'm excited to see you, Ashley. Darshan is there. Ashley, look at Craig Lipset's posts. <laughs> You're going to love it. We got to figure out how to use that as marketing for our conference. You're going to stick your face on it. Yeah, it's a free market system. Like, <laughs> And who do we have promoting? Well, there's no I, promoting. Actually, that would be in violation of California law. Did you not know about this? Well, I'm not there anymore. Thank God. Yeah, California. Yesterday's news, I think, was I think it's AI generated content um, where you're impersonating someone else is not allowed. So you can't oh, no, stick we're not your impersonating. face. If you stick your face on Craig Lips's body, that's kind of what you're doing. Well, I have expressed written consent from him that I may do so. Oh, as long as you have that. As long as you have that. Or implied consent. How about that? <laughs> it gets it's great. Not implied if he doesn't know and wouldn't consent. It starts getting fuzzy. That's where we need you. <laughs> come, come save me. with the, when, when is black and white help make me fuzzy? Make it fuzzy. That's right. Um, okay. So I love how they actually clarify what is right in these types of clinical trials. Decentralized trials may be appropriate for investigative products that have well-characterized safety profiles, which means that probably your phase ones, not so great. Phase two A's, probably not so great. Right. Two B's onwards, you might start seeing an argument. So mm. that should tell you a little bit. To be uh, safe, maybe phase three, but to be really safe, yeah. some people will say never. Phase, yeah. Some people might say that. Some people might say only in post approvals. Right. Like a phase four. Some people might say second indication, maybe. So, and at, at the things. end of the day, it's up to like if you're a research site, this yeah. is nice to know, but ultimately the sponsor is telling you what to do, more or less. Yes. And in fact, the sponsor has a bunch of responsibilities in this guidance. Yeah. yeah. Um, like I, there was one study where it was a foreign sponsor. You, you can tell, and they had us. You know how like there's studies with unblinded pharmacist. That's not really a pharmacist. It doesn't have to be a pharmacist. Okay. So <clears throat> they wanted. This was the first time I've ever been asked us to make our own prescription pad to show proof that a script was written by the PI, even though it's going to our own, like, MA who's serving as pharmacist. They just wanted to see a documentation change. Oh, oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. Well, it doesn't make any sense, Why? practically speaking, because Why? we've never had to do this in but any that doesn't study. mean it doesn't make sense. Because there's already an IRT. There's already somebody going in there you know, with the order, it's implied that the PI is already telling the staff, hey, we're following the protocol. How this do you know the do. PI told the staff that? Because the IRT, like the PI has to sign off on every visit. But when but, do they sign off? When do they sign off? Uh, during the visit, at the, the end, whenever they want. That's not true. We both know that's not true. So you're saying that making that prescription. Is... Oh, yeah. That should be something you do up front. You, you don't. You want, and this is true, not, I remember this when we were doing this in pharmacies, right? Uh, mm -hmm. When I used to work in a hospital, you'd always get the doc call up and go, like a verbal order going, oh yeah, just just give this thing out. Right, and then right, we'd write right. a prescription going, uh, write an order saying, verbal order, blah, 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 doctor said. Right. We've all moved away from that. Jayco is enough. not a big fan of that. Ah, okay. So verbal orders are not preferred. Jayco pushes back on that. Even and if that it's was, documented. That's been like five years. Was that? Even if it's documented. The verbal well, order. you're the one doing the documenting, so it's really hard for. So you need the counter signature, and that counter signature doesn't come for weeks out until after the order. Even the doctors like constantly in the in the uh, charts. I so see. you often you want contemporaneous writing. It's Alcoa, remember? Okay. So fair enough. Uh, yeah. Um, to the point you were making, though. Remember the last podcast we did? You were talking about how one of the uh, meds that you were writing that they were making was complex. This would not be appropriate for complex uh, preparation, administration, 
or medical assessments. So again, specific studies would automatically be excluded. I actually, and there's another component that I think a lot of sponsors may not consider, especially at cons- I think around um, either temperature labile drugs or sterility stability based drugs. I'll talk right. about that. Right, we got into that last time too. Yeah. Um, again, uh, follow up assessments can be for- performed remotely through electronic patient report outcome measures by telehealth or in home visits or by local HCPs. If you're going to use uh, electronic patient report outcome measures, is your um, Electron. First of all, is that legal in your state? Because uh, it may or may not be. Let's assume it is. How are you getting the data? Is it controlled? And they actually talk a little bit about this. I'm going to jump ahead because I do have a bit of a hard stop, but I want to point this out. This is a 23, 21 page guidance, but they actually talk about having a data management plan. And this is something we've never done as far as I know. The sponsor should include the following. So the sponsor should have one. Yeah. But I don't, under, I don't fully understand what the point of it would be. The sponsor should have, this is how data flows. Okay, what is the FDA going to do with that? Like, well, this is I, just trickles down more work for sites. Because what this does is it makes the sponsor have a form or a series of forms that sites now need to fill out. I mean, we're already doing this anyways. Yeah, but to, from a privacy standpoint, what you're really doing, so you already need to do this from a privacy standpoint. And the reason you needed to do that is to identify where data could sort of get lost um, and where you'd have privacy leaks. The question is, in this scenario, let's say the idea, I mean, I can tell you right now where the uh, management plan breaks will be. Every time there's a human intervention, you're going to have a problem, except the entire clinical trial system is set up with human intervention, appropriately so. So what is the point of writing out a data management plan when we know it's kind of flawed from a data flow perspective? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's, it's, I don't fully know where they're going with this. I think it's probably going to land up being more problematic for sites and sponsors. So be careful about what you do here. Um, yeah, another reason to come to Save Our Sites, saveoursites.com. Did you get saveoursites.com? That's awesome. That's a hard yeah, one to get. Of course. That wasn't yeah. hard at all. <laughs> By the way, I I haven't used this yet, but I actually got fdalawguy.com to send to fdalawguy.com. Yeah. Hmm. Now you got to get fdalawgal.com too, just to make That's sure. That's right, no just in case. It. Yeah. Um. Okay, so participants home. Someone okay. buy that one right now and sell it back to Darshan. <laughs> the dude's kicked up. Uh, participants home, mobile research units, or local healthcare facilities. Um. I don't know how many people are doing mobile research units. Are you aware of any? Uh, I mean, there used to be a company that had a business model around it. I really? believe they were called Care Access. I remember it was like a pretty big news story in our circle. Um, okay. Research on a bus was their motto. Oh, interesting. Uh, I mean, I guess they passed the FDA audits with no findings somehow. But um, yeah, um, I don't see how after reading all these guidances every week from you. Um, so this goes to training or video supervision. So that's going to become another thing. Training or video supervision. During a telehealth visit may help with limiting variability. You said training patients. Uh, Let me it tell could you be training something. patients. It could be training other p- clinical people as well. Let me tell you everyone something real quick. This part, patient diary sounds like such a good idea. Like, oh, it's more data. Of course we want everything's data data is the new oil let's get everything data give them every day a diary all right the problem is patients they get busy they that's a burden there's a big concept around this now patient burden i've seen firsthand on studies i've worked on studies failing good drugs failing because of these daily diaries yep because Somebody needs to police the patients and the sites don't think about it. The sites are just looking at every visit, every office visit, right? Mm -hmm. No one's looking at every day or sometimes multiple times a day. The patient's required to enter something in the diary. Patients make typos all the time. I've had patients tell me, yeah, I just click whatever to get through the next screen. This, the design on this thing's horrible. Yeah. So they're just putting random things in there. You as a site are supposed to retrain them. Hey, I know it's annoying. 
Right. But you got to pay attention because this is important stuff. Yep. Maybe you get through to them, maybe you don't, and then you got to decide whether you drop them from the study or not. This is going to fail. This is one of those things where sponsors say, oh, great idea, sign me up. We have data as the new oil to where it's going to mess up your NDA submission. So number one, data as the new oil is a huge problem because mm. under GDPR, you can't just be collecting data because it's nice to have. What you about have... all these exploratory endpoints that they do? Well, that's the question. You can have it for a certain amount of time. If you're not using it, then it, you may not hold on to it for an indefinite period of time. That's so what isn't it, it's never been GDPR easier to use random data. But I don't understand the question. Or the it's point. never been easier to use to have applications and use cases for random data. Yeah, it may not have, but they still don't use it, right? So mm -hmm. you might have people actually did this, right? People just collect data because data was the new oil. Yeah. And, and uh, governments are basically coming out and saying that's not good enough. You can't just collect it because you might want it someday. Yeah, only the government can do that, guys. Come on. <laughs> yeah, basically, right? Um, so they then come out and say, so the goal for them is obviously limiting variability. Just to be clear, we've now done a 40-minute podcast. We're on page four. No, page seven, page seven, page seven. But really page four. Y'all going to have some reading to do. You yeah. guys let me know what you read. I'm not reading this. Let me know if there's anything interesting. This um, is stuff we've been doing since 2002. Well, I think your big issues are going to land up being... So I'll, I'll sort of give you... Because uh, I do have to jump off in about five, seven minutes or so. Ah. Um, what, I, what I do want to point out is we talked a little bit about... And, and, and this goes to what you're saying, which is I think sites will continue to remain very important. Um, because number one, you need to still have places people can do the audits. So you can do an audit of 50 different locations. So you still need a centralized, um, a centralized place you can do monitoring. You also need to have a, um, a you need to have a clear process where the sponsor can send the drug or the device. Because how a few different issues that pop into that, right? So one is how do you make sure that the drug, when it gets shipped and it reaches the patient, the patient's going to get it. How do you how do you handle the privacy element of it? How do you handle the element of um, if it's if it is a um, the standard of care is being paid for by the government, um, the appropriate copay is being paid if necessary. If the appropriate if um, if the standard of care is not being paid for by the government, how do you make sure from a privacy standpoint the patient got it? How do you make sure that the drug when it shipped uh, was not kept in a hot um, UPS truck? for far too long. Um, and people go, well, that doesn't happen. UPS drivers are literally keeling over from how hot that thing is. Yeah. It's happening every single they day. They have the, like, um, those little sticks, those little USB sticks in there. Uh, yeah. Every shipment. The temperature controls are our major issue. Right. But we're trained to when we get a package, put yep, it in. Pack, and all Patient's that stuff. not going to do any of that. Exactly right. Yeah. So does that mean that you're now going to tie this to a local pharmacy? How is that going to play itself out? Yeah, well, Walgreens needs extra revenue, I hear. Their stock's <laughs> doing terrible. Not a good stock to own. Not financial advice, either. Exactly. I do recommend, while we have a break, AQST. I do own it. I'm I don't know. Very I bullish look on into this it. company. Yeah. Um, Listerine strip epinephrine. That's interesting. Uh, yep. So sublingual epinephrine, basically. Yep. Which is interesting, because it gets past. It's a buccally absorbed. Yep. Uh, it should be pretty immediate. All studies uh, no done, they're going to be they're going to be submitting um, to the FDA before the end of the year, and then they'll probably have a Padufa date of. But like, why? Why not why? do a shot? People are the compliance. Um, yeah, if you're no dying, one, I mean, I I get it. I, I no one wants to carry a briefcase with them, um, and it's, why you epinephrine is a shot, like it's a single like syringe. There's a case. There's a case, and it's it becomes cumbersome to like be compliant. This fits on the back of everyone's phone. No, I'm not saying. Again, that raises the risk that it'll get misused or it gets abused in some way. And again, yeah. uh, you put it on the back of the phone. The phone over phone overheats. Does that epinephrine work when you need it to? Yeah, they did the studies. I'm trying to get the uh, senior director of sales on. Shout out to <laughs> Sherry Krasinski. She keeps in ignoring my messages, but she did say okay once, <laughs> so there's a chance. She has to be worried about SEC disclosures and stuff, so she may not. Oh, be no, no, we're just talking about her career. Okay, fair enough. 
Yeah. If she talks to enough people like you, they're going to tell her no. So, <laughs> Sherry, ignore what Darshan just said. You're good. <laughs> or, or just hire Darshan to know how to do it right. Oh, there you, you go. Want. There you go. Um, they, t- they talk about privacy here. And that's great. But if you're talking about privacy, remember that you're not just talking GDPR. You're not just talking CCPA. In this case, you're actually talking about CMEA, which most people don't even r- realize happens. So um, CMEA is California, for example. I'm picking on California because it's the most famous one. It's their medical law, medical privacy law, which most people don't even know exist. So <laughs> keep, keep track of that. I just, so we've been tr- talk, we've talked about GDPR. We've talked about CCPA and stuff before. I was looking at a recent lawsuit involving um, uh, pixels and cookies and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Do you know what that implicates, by the way? Because it, lo- it was actual lawsuits against actual large companies. Um, and Health you know privacy. The- yeah, you'd think privacy, right? Yeah. Wiretapping. So they looked into wiretapping laws and they're suing the companies based on wiretapping laws. Like Patriot Act type of things? Sort of. Not oh. quite, but yeah. So the idea is that if you're tracking someone who didn't consent to being tracked in that way. Yeah. Is that actually wiretapping? Well, now every website has accept cookies or reject them. I mean, it's so annoying, man. Every single website. Well, that's GDPR requires that and CCPA yeah. requires that. But even, even if you, your, your consent policy needs to be updated. So those people who are just listening in still, um, you're, you need to make sure that whenever you design your website, have someone see if it's ADA compliant, American with, Americans with Disabilities Act. Because you're seeing people sue based on non-compliance. Wow, I remember you telling me this. Yeah, it's still happening. It's a big deal. Wow. Um, so they are suing research sites. Sites. They're suing pharmacies. They're suing anyone because it's very, very general. So keep track of that. Uh-huh. And make sure your privacy policy, for example, has... Compl- uh, and I, I know, Dan, you've dealt with this issue, TCPA compliance. So if you're going to use text messaging for reminders and stuff, you need to be uh, what TCR compliant, TCPA compliant. So you need to have the appropriate privacy policy on there saying that we're checking up on all of these things. If you're going to be, for example, tracking people using pixels or using cookies, you need to get the consent to do that. Yeah. Um, so update your privacy policies as well. Um, we can keep going, but how, how is this looking so far? We are just at page five right now. Just to be I mean, I feel like this medical spa is like this mythical unicorn will never like actually tap. <laughs> well, I think that's part of the goal, right? Keep coming back for the... Did you ever watch uh, Jimmy Kimmel when he would talk about we're going to have uh, Matt Damon back at some point and he'd never come on and that was the whole joke? Uh, no, but I can't stand the guy, but it uh, seems like this yeah. scenario as well. Yeah, basically. Okay. So similar. We will get to the medical spa someday. Good morning, Monica. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Monica. SOS. Monica, go check out Craig Lipset's post. Let me know. Craig, a lot of people checking him out right now. Dude, you don't piss off Craig, man. And you don't disrespect Craig. That's right. Period. The the Craig will come calling. Uh, He he is the one who knocks. That's from Heisenberg. (laughs) That's the breaking bad one. Yeah, man. He brought me back to 2013 on that one. That's right. Well, you got a hard stop. I mean, I do. I do. Do you want to just stop off. it right now? Yeah. Thank uh, you, Baba Yaga. Feel free to reach out. Baba we're Yaga, gonna everybody. Thing. We're going to do the unveiling of your, like the unboxing. Have you unboxed your thing? I have yet? not yet unboxed it, but. Okay, please uh, do it. I don't care if it's with me. Okay. I will, I will do, do the it. unboxing with you. Do a video and we have to like reveal it somehow. That's so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. I will like, subscribe, it. comment, share. Go follow Darshan right now. None of you are compliant. Bye-bye.